just wanted to start with the, uh, a couple of disclaimers. The first thing is that whatever I'm going to say does not represent the views of the organization I'm working uh, for today, the IEA. And the second thing, the pathway of Tunisia to democracy does not uh, represent a model, it just represents a pathway, a potential pathway in the region, and every single country would have different realities, different uh, conditions. Uh, we just had this way that I will describe uh, the process, how we got there, and also discuss where we are going from uh, from uh, from this situation. So, um, if we go a little bit on the history, and I don't know if I'm getting through uh, on your way. Uh, I was in Tunisia in uh, December 2010, and if you had asked me uh, in December if there was any chance for uh, the uh, for Ben Ali to be, uh, who was the president at that time, to be ousted, I would say the chances are extremely low, because the regime was so strong, it had such a strong police presence and uh, a control of the, the whole country that the event that started on December 17th in the uh, city of Sidi Bouzid, which is in the center towards the south of Tunisia, of the uh, uh, street salesman that uh, got into an argument with a, a, a police, someone from the police, and then as a result, uh, he uh, put himself in, uh, in fire, and, um, and after uh, a couple of weeks, he uh, unfortunately died. That event was really what started the whole process. And people may uh, ask, how did that single event uh, lead to this, uh, this uh, revolution? Uh, actually, the, the, the role of the social media has been extremely important. And uh, just a few months before that event, there was an attempt by, uh, by Ben Ali to shut down Facebook in the country. And that was actually there, that led to very strong protest. Uh, people really felt that uh, that was uh, too much and he had to restore Facebook. And Facebook, and as well as uh, other media, have uh, played a, a role in terms of informing people about the development of the situation uh, we had riots in some uh, cities, we had uh, some people who died from this. And so uh, what, what happened is at some point the army said, we will not back you up. We will not go and kill people uh, given the, the, the growth of the, uh, the movement. And from that point it was the, uh, the, the end for Ben Ali. And so he left on January 14th. 2011. The, um, there, was, there were a series of governments with, uh, with a short duration, uh, three governments. In October, there were the elections in Tunisia, uh, which were not, I mean, using the, uh, the existing framework for elections. And to the surprise of many, uh, the, uh, the Nahda government was won the elections. They didn't have the majority, but they won a significant part of the election. And what they did was they decided, going forward, to associate with uh, themselves with two other parties so that they would have a majority of the parliament. And they had this system which is called the Troika, the three uh, persons uh, ruling system, with the, uh, the head of the government being from the religious party, another, the head of the parliament being from another party, and the president uh, from a third party, uh, Mazuki. So that happened in October 2011, first government, and then we started seeing uh, a number of issues due to the fact that most people that were brought uh, were actually didn't have any experience with, the, uh, with uh, ruling the country. And we had also uh, 
problems uh, in uh, places like uh, Syria or Iraq because what happened is that there was a, a high outflow of people from Tunisia at that time. We estimate the number to be anywhere from three to 4,000 that went to Syria and Iraq uh, as a result of two things. One was a push uh, which is due to the initiative of uh, President Marzouki, Tunisian president, to convene a, a meeting of the uh, so-called Friends of Syria uh, to, to support the, uh, the uh, protest movements of, uh, of Syria. And the second thing was some also support from the, uh, the, the, uh, the more extremist uh, part of this uh, another government that pushed those people to go. So we're still paying the price today from, uh, from what happened during that time. And then February, we had uh, something that was a shock for the population, which was the uh, political as, uh, assassination of uh, Shokri Belaid, uh, who was one of the uh, leaders, seculars, in Tunisia. This has led, in March, of to the uh, creation of a southern government, again from the Troika with these three parties. And July, second time, we had uh, a very well-known uh, person from the, uh, the, uh, from the uh, left side of the, uh, of the uh, political system, Mohamed Brahmi, who was also assass assassinated. So that has led to, uh, to the uh, a significant crisis in the country. The process that had been started to, uh, to have a new constitution was locked. There was nobody wanted to discuss any further progress there. So in 2000, at the uh, second half of 2013, there was the creation of this quartet. And the quartet was constituted of four uh, components of the civil society. The first one was the main union, uh, of, which is called UGTT. Uh, that has always played a role in Tunisia, a strong role. It's almost the single union in the country. The second one was the confederation of the industry uh, called Utica. So these two forces generally fight uh, between each other, but in that case, they, they got together. The third uh, component of this quartet was the, uh, the, the League of Human Rights, and the fourth component was the League of Lawyers. So these four created a quartet and decided that something had to be done. And this was called the National Dialogue. This National Dialogue uh, included several of the political parties. Uh, and to try to find, uh, we say in France, uh, feuille de route, in, uh, in English it's roadmap to uh, to leave the country uh, out of the uh, crisis. So that was the second half of 2013. The, uh, many uh, people ask, but why Tunisia? Why did Tunisia have the beginning of the Arab Spring? Uh, why did Tunisia go through this process of dialogue? Actually, uh, there were a series of firsts in the region uh, for that will happen in Tunisia. But before we, I go to this list, it's very interesting, uh, is in Tunisia we had already 500 years before uh, DC, uh, we had the constitution that was during the Carthage time. And that happened, that came Carthage, uh, the people there came from Lebanon, and they had a very interesting constitution, which was uh, the, uh, a little bit like the British system today, where they had two, uh, two uh, chambers. The first one is the, uh, the one that is elected by the people, and the second one is constituted by uh, representatives of the families, of the big families during Carthage. And this, uh, this constitution is uh, cited by Aristotle and, uh, and uh, others as being uh, an example of, uh, of uh, a good progressive constitution. But let's uh, go fast forward. 1846, 
we had the uh, abolition of slavery, which was the first time that uh, that uh, was uh, announced in the area. 1857 was also a very significant event because this was the fundamental pact and bill of rights which gave to all the citizens in Tunisia the same rights. Uh, so that bill of rights was really uh, was uh, a great uh, push for uh, giving the same rights to everyone. And 1861 was the first constitution again in the region uh, he gave a number of rights, defines the uh, the system with parliament. And so, uh, independence of Tunisia happened in 1956, and then the first thing, one of the first things that uh, President Bourguiba uh, did uh, just after the independence is the Code du Statut Personnel, the Code of Personal Status, which was based on a lot of work that was done by uh, people like Taha Haddad and others who really were advocating the, the place of women in the society uh, and to try to change the perception. And so that was what gave the women's right, which I would say in 99% were the same as the men's right. Uh, possibility to divorce, uh, possibility to, uh, I mean, the, the, the free choice of uh, who uh, she's going to get married to, and also the, uh, the uh, monogamy uh, system, which was the first in the region as well. So the only uh, thing that didn't get changed was inheritance rules, uh, which were uh, related to the, uh, to the uh, Koran and uh, I think that even if President Bourguiba wanted to change that, uh, I don't think that uh, he was advised not to do it. Uh, so, but in all other aspects, women's rights were, uh, were the same as men's rights. In 1959, the second constitution uh, was, which really uh, described the citizen's right. It was a presidential type system. Uh, and uh, many advanced features that happened in this constitution. So that was the, uh, the, uh, the, the history that led them. When we moved from the uh, 2000, 1959 constitution to the 2014 constitution, what happened is that a number of, uh, of uh, uh, articles in the original constitutions have been changed by first President Bourguiba himself, and then by President Ben Ali, who came in 1987 after a coup, and started putting more and more restrictions and putting more and more powers to the, uh, to the president, like uh, president for life in the time of Bourguiba, and then also in the, uh, during Ben Ali, the possibility to go way beyond the two terms that were initially in the Constitution. So what happened in the new Constitution, there were a lot of arguments, but the first thing, uh, and despite the very strong push from the, uh, from the uh, Nahda, was maintaining the first article about state and religion. So making sure that there was no, uh, the, the, uh, we had the secular system. The second thing is the guaranteeing, and this could not be changed, going forward of citizens' rights and protection of women's rights. The third one was a transformation of a system that used to be a presidential one to be a more parliamentary one, with the president of government being having more, uh, much more rights, more, much more power. Uh, the fourth one was the ju judicial powers, uh, which we, with the constitutional court, and the Supreme Council for the uh, for the uh, the law. We also have as the uh, five independent institutions one that would be managing the elections, and we'll come back to that. Information, human rights, sustainable development, and future generations, and then governments. And then the sixth part, which is going from a centralized uh, regime to a much more a regional regime, to allow more participation at the regional level. So we had in January 
and this was a result of the uh, this national dialogue at the Quartet, the decision that the uh, the Trika government had failed, and we needed to go to uh, a different system until actually the elections that were uh, defined in the new constitution uh, were organized. So the decision was taken to bring a government of people that they call the technocrats, who were people that were not coming from political system, and that would run this process uh, during this transition. So that was quite a, an interesting move. Uh, they appointed someone, uh, Mehdi Joma, uh, who, uh, who was the Minister of Industry uh, in the uh, in the Trika government, and they said, okay, now your mission is to define this government. <clears throat> so um, here he is. He has a few conditions. One of them is that any minister should be outside the political system. He should be, he or she, should not be from a political party. They also would uh, this, uh, I mean, make the declaration that, or the statement that they would not run for political uh, seats uh, after this uh, this government. And so he uh, he did a, a fantastic job in consulting a, no a large number of people. And so uh, I was at that time in working in Slumberger in uh, Brazil. And uh, I received a call on Sunday morning. Sunday morning, I like to go on uh, jogging on Ipan Ipanema Beach, <laughs> which is uh, as close to paradise as you could imagine. And then, I don't know why on that day, I had my, uh, my uh, mobile phone. Uh, my mobile phone rings, and this gentleman <coughs> introduced himself and said, OK, uh, we, uh, I'm Mr. X, OK? Uh, and uh, we would like to consider you for the, the position of Minister of Industry, Energy and Mines. <clears throat> so I said, okay, no, thank you very much. How much time do I have to decide? <laughs> Two hours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so that, that's how I got into, the, um, into this government. And then the government was a small team, relatively small team, 22 ministers, and six secretaries of state. Uh, one third of them came from outside the country, had absolutely no uh, relation with government. They were working with either private sector or they were working with uh, international institutions. Uh, and so here we are, we arrive. Uh, we had an empty uh, page, but we had to do something together. And that was the, the beginning of this, uh, this team, Les Technocrats, which I'm going to describe now. So what were the, the priorities for this uh, government of technocrats? So the first one is ensure that the elections, the first elections in the country that would be run under this new constitution would be running smoothly and by the end of 2014. That was January 2014, so we had until the end of the year. The second thing is restore the country's security, because during the, uh, the year from 2011 to 2013, they have had, we have had many issues. We had political assassinations. We had also uh, a number of events in Tunisia and outside of Tunisia that, uh, that led to a very volatile situation. <clears throat> the third one is that, from an economic standpoint, uh, Tunisia used to have quite uh, a well-run budget in terms of maintaining balances between the, uh, the macros. But during, after the revolution, uh, they went into a spending spree, uh, they went into hiring, uh, dozens of thousands of uh, public servants. They went into uh, huge salary increases. So all that has led to a very significant budget deficit. We used to run in the uh, 2 to 3% budget deficit, but then in 2014, we were heading to 10% budget deficit, which is uh, extremely uh, 
this would be the first time in the, the country's history. The, the fourth point was, uh, within that time frame, develop a set of reforms that will enable uh, an investment favorable to climate. And then finally, is work with the social partners to try to manage labor expectations. Labor expectations from both the, uh, the people who didn't have a job and also the people who wanted to have uh, significant salary increases. So this, is, this was our roadmap to, uh, to lead the country. And again, these people, most of them, have never had any experience of government. Uh, we, uh, we found this word of the bureaucracy, and so we had to, uh, to adapt. And I think one of the first things that we decided to do, just like what you do in, uh, in the private sector or another organization, we went into a series of team buildings which really allowed the team to work together directly and have direct contacts. So if you needed uh, a solution to a problem that would involve one or, or other colleagues, we would just call each other and have it sorted out. So that really helped and, uh, in the process. During the, uh, the, this time, what we saw is that Tunisia competitiveness, and I'm using here the World Economic Forum, uh, the, the rating of, the, uh, of, uh, of Tunisia, in 2010, it was ranked 32nd in 139 countries. And you have several uh, factors in this spider diagram that shows the country's position compared to peers or to the international scene. In 2014, there has been a very significant deterioration of the country's competitiveness. <coughs> we were ranked 87th out of 144 countries. So we lost 55 seats in this competitiveness rate. So that was not the good news. But the good news is that we have structural advantages that we, uh, and here I'm using a traffic light system, uh, green, yellow and, and red to show what, where we had structural advantages. I would say from the institutions, it was a yellow. From an infrastructure, it was a yellow. We had green signs on health and primary education. We had green signs on higher education. Uh, market size and business sophistication, we had good signs. But we had red signs on market efficiency, both from the goods and the labor side, financial market development, and macroeconomic development. And innovation was not also in the system. The uh, Tunisia economy had developed in uh, a low-cost type supply for, uh, for, uh, for Europe in a number of uh, sectors that didn't really have too much value added. Okay, so that is the situation, and we had to reverse the trend of losing our competitiveness. So the objectives were, on the short term, fix the, the issues that were really related to the conjuncture, to the, the current situation, and then define for the medium term the, a new industrial strategy that would, uh, with the implementation of the required reform. So this would be our objectives going there. Okay, so that is what we wanted to do. And in the case of industry, what we uh, decided to do is to have a, a reform with four strategic pillars. One is uh, define the key sectors where we would, the country would invest. So we decided to go for aerospace, uh, because there was already a nucleus of aerospace industry working with Airbus and other uh, aerospace uh, uh, companies, automotive, pharmacy, textile and clothing, and agriculture. So these were the five key sectors that we, uh, we uh, selected. We also defined the structural reforms that we, uh, we wanted to, uh, to do. Uh, one is update the investment code in the country go to much more into public-private partnerships, PPPs, uh, go to public market, 
reform the financial system, and reform the logistic system. The third one is that is an enabler for the transformation is to go and, and uh, improve the hosting organization, the industrial zones, the technology clusters, and the logistics platforms. And then fourth is to have a more inclusive development with uh, the regional development policy that would be a matrix between the five key sectors and the different regions around the world. And what we used there were the strength assets, which were innovation, market, and education and R&D. One of the big uh, pillars of uh, Bourguiba's, President Bourguiba's strategy has been a focus on the education sector from the, uh, both the primary, secondary, and the, uh, the university sector. So what happened during uh, Ben Ali's presidency is that those policies uh, lost ground and we started actually developing much more uh, graduates in areas that we really did not need graduates in. And so we had a very high unemployment rate of graduate people. And there were sectors that we were actually lacking uh, employment because we didn't have the, the, the people to do the job. I'm going to take an example that, uh, that uh, I worked on was uh, on the energy, apart from the industry. We had, Tunisia had quite a, a good uh, energy uh, uh, infrastructure. We had 60 operators uh, in the hydrocarbon sector. Uh, we had, production is not very high, 60,000 to 70,000 barrels per day. But we had a good infrastructure. We also had a good development in gas and interconnection. Uh, as early as the 70s, 99% of the Tunisian had access to electricity. So that was quite a good situation. But <coughs> what had happened in the, the period after the revolution is that we completely lost ground in the energy sector. We had a very aggressive policy in terms of energy efficiency in the country. We were the leaders in the area, in the MENA region, in energy efficiency. But then, after the revolution, we start losing ground. Energy subsidies, which is what the government pays to actually provide energy at a lower cost than actually, the, at a lower price than the actual cost, have been multiplied by six between 2010 and 2013. So, to put things in comparison, the energy subsidies were equal to the total public investment, which is really not uh, acceptable. We also had quite a significant increase in energy consumption in buildings and transport, and we also had a, a large number of people coming from Libya, between one and a half million and two million people coming from Libya during that period, which increased significantly the uh, consumption uh, of, uh, of subsidized uh, products. We also uh, saw a very significant deterioration of the trade deficit. So we had to do something there in a very short period of time, in one year time. So we organized what we call the national debate on energy. So we had a team with a number of uh, stakeholders that went across the whole country, we went through the four, 24 different regions in the, uh, in the uh, countries through this consultation process. And we set up with them the vision for the country for 2030 in the <coughs> energy sector. And the consensus is that we needed to rationalize these subsidies. And one specific case that we had was the cement sector. Cement sector, the production of cement in Tunisia has been doing quite well, but using a lot of subsidy. Uh, so because the electricity and the gas that are used by the cement sector are actually uh, both at a lower price than actually what it costs. So who is paying the difference? It's the government, and actually it's coming from the budget. Just to give you a number, for the cement sector, we, uh, we, ha we were paying from the government $150 million per year as subsidies to the cement sector, $150 million. 
may not appear a lot, but for Tunisia scale, it's quite important. So what we decided to do is we sat down with the industry, the cement industry, and we said, look, we cannot go this way. We are going to cut the subsidy. You should have seen the reaction. No, you're going to destroy the sector. Uh, it's, you're going to have an, uh, uh, an increase, significant increase in the pricing of uh, houses and so on. And then we said, okay, but let's look in the details. 6% of the price of a house is cement. So even if we go from 6 to 8, it's not going to change the, uh, the price of it. But we said also, at the same time, we will liberalize the market so you can sell it at the price you want. So we had the uh, consumer association who said, but you are crazy, that's going to lead to uh, an inflation in uh, cement prices. But then at the end of the day, after we implemented this complete removal of subsidies, the consumer was paying a lower price than what he was paying before. The second part was the industry was selling at a higher price. And the third is that the, the government was not paying any more subsidies. So we had a win-win-win. So you may ask who lost. It's actually the middlemen who were actually between the, uh, the uh, production side and the distribution that lost. But who, who cares? <laughs> so other things that we, uh, we wanted to do is that uh, investment in fossil energies, we had, uh, this has gone down significantly after the revolution, and also improved the electricity interconnection. So these were, again, using the same framework, what we define as being our strategic pillars to, uh, for the energy sector between hydrocarbon resources. We also uh, passed a renewable energy law with an objective by 2030 to have 30% of electricity consumption from renewable, which is about 3.7 uh, 3 gigawatts. Energy efficiency to push even further on energy efficiency. So we had social programs. One of them was we realized that people, if they want, if you wanted them to change their light bulbs by much more efficient ones like the LEDs, could not do it because they could not afford it. So we went to a free distribution of LED lights to, uh, to the people so that they would exchange their lights and have a much more efficient system. But what we wanted to do avoid is that people getting those lights, these LEDs, and go and sell them in the market. So we went into an exchange and we worked with NGOs to do it. So that was part of the, uh, the energy efficiency and also strengthening the network. So all these were part of the, uh, the uh, system that we put together to reform our energy system, which was under uh, my ministry. So these are the, uh, we also had a lot of problems to go into uh, the renewable energy uh, law because the unions so, saw it as a threat to the, uh, the main electricity supplier, but that's the kind of fights, fights that you have to, uh, to live with. So these were the, the priorities. I think if we go through the five priorities, the, uh, the first one was done uh, in terms of, uh, of the elections. In terms of security, uh, the, the government created this task force that really was effective because we didn't have any terrorist attack against the population. Unfortunately, we had a, an attack against the army, uh, which left uh, about 10 soldiers dead, but uh, against the population there were no terrorist attacks. In terms of uh, macroeconomic balances, we were heading to 10% budget deficit, we finished the year at 4%. So the people from the IMF were extremely ecstatic. They said, frankly, we would not think that you could have done that. Uh, in terms of reforms for the investment favorable climate, we start doing things, but we had a lot of resistance, uh, especially from the unions, to go into deep reforms. The argument was to say, look, you are not here for the long term, so focus on the short term. And in terms of social partners, uh, we had quite a, an interesting dialogue, if we want to call it like this, with the unions. But at the end, 
I mean, we, uh, we explained that we, uh, we had a mission and our role was not to give in to unreasonable uh, expectations. If we look at it in terms of uh, what happened of the uh, satisfaction rating between 2012 and 2015, essentially uh, 2012, the first government of the Troika, uh, very high expectation from people. Uh, the satisfaction rating was at 60%, but you see that it went down quite significantly. It went to 30%, and then it remained below 30%. Uh, the, when the government came in, it took some time for the satisfaction rating to come up. And I would say by the time uh, this government left, we had a satisfaction rating of about 70%. So, which was uh, quite a significant change in terms of perception of the, uh, of the population of the, the government. So, we had the elections. Uh, October 2014, the elections went smoothly. Uh, we had the legislative elections, and then we had the second, first and second round of the presidential elections. Uh, on the presidential elections, we had uh, President uh, Bejika Tsepsi, uh, who is uh, a person with significant experience, who has been during the Bogiba government. And at the end of the Bogiba's time, he left and then it went into uh, his law practice uh, and was not involved with the Ben Ali's government. So he's, he became the, uh, the president. And basically on a mandate against the, uh, as a secular type mandate uh, against the religious uh, candidate who was pushed, uh, who was uh, President Mazuk. So the, the uh, Gov the uh, legislative and presidential elections, uh, the way it was organized, we had an independent institution, which is called the EASY, which was in charge of organizing the elections in terms of defining the, the rules. The government was providing all the material support and also the security support to ensure a smooth, the, a smooth uh, election process. So this, the fact that you had this independent uh, institution was actually quite useful because we separated the role of the government from the role of the uh, organizing the elections. We were extremely pleased because, uh, let's say, our minimum target was 60% participation in the elections. We had 68.4%, which was a very good one. We see the picture of both the prime minister and the head of the institution for the uh, for the elections, Mr. Sasa. So, in terms of results of the uh, of the elections, the first party uh, that came out was the president of uh, the party of President Kaita Sebsi, Nida Tunis. That was uh, that is a secular party with a significant. Uh, influence of the Bourguiba's type uh, time uh, system, uh, not Benali, but more Bourguiba's time, and so they won 37.6 percent of the votes and almost 40 percent of the seat. Another, who is the that is the uh, the religious party, had 28 percent of the vote uh, and 32 percent of the seats, and then you had a series of secular parties. UPL, which is a, a party, uh, let's say a liberal party, created by a, a businessman, had 16 uh, seats. Front Populaire is our left side, a coalition of several countries, uh, several parties uh, that had about 15 seats. Uh, FR Tunis, that is, uh, let's say, uh, a liberal uh, center-right type uh, movement that had eight seats, and then all the other movements that had 24%, but 10% of the seats. So you have, you didn't have a clear majority as a result of the election. So any party that would normally, as per the constitution, the Nida Tunis would select a prime minister. And in order to do that, you look at the, uh, the percentage 
uh, if you want to have more than 50%, you need to have uh, a coalition between Nidatuns, about 40, and then at least two other parties. The uh, Front Populaire, which is the left, uh, leftist uh, parties or a group of parties, did not want to be involved. Mm -hmm. I think they are called the uh, party of no, because they're always against any decision. Uh, so the way it was done is that uh, the Nida Tunis went with UPL 7.4, and then FR Tunis plus some independents. And also, they managed to have a dialogue with another, uh, so that they would create a government that would represent the different sensitivities. But with a minor role for another, again, the religious part. If we look at the elections uh, in terms of where things, who won the, the, uh, the elections in the different regions, 24 regions, we see on red the ones that are Nida Tunis, which are the secular, and then the blue, which are the religious one, and Nada. And we see a big divide, <clears throat> basically, the northern part of the country has voted for Nidetons, and the southern part has voted for another. Basically, uh, because most of the wealth of the country is in the northern part and in the coastal side. And uh, the other parts of the country did not have the same uh, development pattern as the other ones. So we see this divide and any policy that or uh, system would have to reduce this uh, deep divide in the countries. So the new government uh, so uh, took place on February uh, 6, 2015, which gave us the opportunity to, uh, from our government, to hand the keys to this government. So that was the uh, where we got the uh, the new government. Uh, that started in February 6, uh, had, was much larger. Uh, it had 27 ministers instead of 22. It had 14 secretaries of state, uh, up from six. So basically, there was a 50% increase in the number of seats in the government, basically to try to please the different parties that were parts of the coalition. Good thing is that the number of women uh, in the government increased to, to eight, up from three from our government. I think that was uh, one of the weak points from our government. We did not have enough diversity in our government, but let's say the, 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 the period was so short to create the government that uh, we, uh, I don't think there were many options. So in terms of parties represented, we had Nida Tunis, UPL, Afer Tunis, and Amarda and then a numbers of independents. So that was this coalition government. So they started working on February 6th with a new system for the country, which is now a parliamentary system, with weaker role for the, government, for the president, and for a mandate that would cover up to five years. But as soon as the government took a position, we start seeing a, a number of things to hit the government. February 6th, government in place. February 8th, we had big demonstrations in the south of the country, near the Libyan border, uh, and big clashes there. Uh, we believe that they were organized by the, uh, by the mafia that is running the traffic between the countries, the two countries, doing traffic of uh, gasoline and all kinds of things. So that was a big coup for the government. The second one was February 15th, just one week after they took place. The, uh, the, the main unit started, uh, especially the hardcore, started a very uh, bad series of strikes uh, to welcome the government, asking for very uh, significant increases in the, uh, in the wages and so on. A march, the mining sector, which represents a significant source of income for the, for the south of the country, uh, was paralyzed by actions, social actions. What was happening is that people 
thought that now they have a government that is in place for several years now and it was the time for them to uh, to start asking for uh, for very uh, big things then march 18th we had the country's largest terrorist attack which was against uh, the the bardo museum with 24 people killed including 21 tourists which was really a shock for the uh, for the country and for the image of the the, the country uh, june 26 we had even worse attack against a popular uh, resort with now 39 people killed including 38 tourists uh, october a series of major, major strikes against the private sector november 24th another terrorist attack against a police bus which left 12 people killed so we never had in tunisia's history such a succession of actions to within the government and whatever the uh, i mean the uh, the strength of the, the the government you really need to have a very very uh, good grounds in order to one uh, go through the the consequences and second thing try to prevent them from from happening uh, these the uh, the touristic attacks had a very significant impact uh, against the the economy because the uh, tourist sector employs directly 6.5 percent of the population and indirectly about 13 or 14 percent of the population so it's a quite a significant uh, and after the, the the two sets of terrorist attacks we had a decline by more than 40 percent in terms of uh, tourism in the country if we look at it in terms of gdp uh, since the uh, the revolution we were before the revolution at gdp growth rates of more than five percent 2010 and this was a consequence of the uh, the global uh, financial crisis the uh, the uh, growth rate was at three percent 2011 year of the revolution we went for the first time into a negative gdp growth 2012 we went back up four percent and then 2013 2014 about three percent but then because of all those events in 2015 we went to uh, almost zero percent GDP growth and it's expected that 2016 will be at about the same level and hopefully going to the uh, 2017 should be back at 3% and above. If we compare to other countries, the, uh, the developing economies at our 5%, which is the green line, uh, Morocco is uh, at the, about 4% and the developing MENA, uh, Middle East, North Africa, is uh, going to be at 3%, uh, above 3% in 2016. So you see that the country is not at the growth rate of its peers in the region and outside the region. What we need, if we want to employ all those people that are coming to the market, we need to have a growth rate of at least 5% per year. So until we get there, we would have significant issues in terms of, uh, of employment. So priority is going forward. Uh, given the uh, Prime Minister uh, Habib Sid changed his government and so decided to a smaller size of government from the 40 and some ministers. We now have 31 ministers and no Secretary of State. The priorities that, uh, that are uh, defined is one create an inclusive development plan for the next five years leading to focus areas both from a geographical area and also from uh, from an economic growth area we need to have a new investment legislation including the different stakeholders interaction public private partnerships and others we need to have administrative and economic and fiscal reforms today the fiscality uh, we have a big problem of the uh, uh, parallel sector of the or the informal economy we have the issue of security with the focus on libyan borders and the threats from 
ISIS, uh, either coming from Libya or coming from the uh, Middle East. We need to change the education uh, sector because we have had quite a good success, but now we change, need to change the, uh, the uh, vocational systems so that we have uh, graduates that are more in line with the economy. And then finally, we need to have a social pact that uh, prevents this escalation of conflicts uh, that are uh, really leading to a worsening of the uh, situation. And the good news is that November, the quartet was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, which was very welcome and really uh, is provided fresh air to the country in terms of image. Now we have to, uh, to work on those priorities if we want to make it a real success. I think the, uh, the success would not come from the outside, the success come from the inside and doing the right reforms. Okay, so with that, thank you very much. I hope you're good. Suck so